welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And today I am sitting down and chatting with somebody I've known for a very long time. Uh, this is Mr. Magic in Newcastle. He's been there. He's done it all. He's the current family entertainer of the year. Uh, he's pretty much performed every single style of magic you could imagine and also he's one of the co-owners of the, the famous magic box up in newcastle this is and also one of the nicest guys in magic i'm speaking of course about the one and only graham shaw graham how you doing mate stop it stop it with all them nice things that you're saying about us and i've got to say how awesome it is to actually be on craig petty's youtube channel Get any awards or anything like that. Like I said, I just, you know, this is this is the pinnacle, right? Forget any TV, anything like that. Anybody watching, you don't want to do any of that. You just want to be on Craig Petty's YouTube channel. And here we are. Mate. I can't <laughs> believe it. Can't believe it. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. You know that I've been a big fan of yours for a very long time. And you have done so much. You know, I kind of referenced it early on. But you, mm. yeah, I mean, we, we're filming this just after the virtual uh, Blackpool convention that happened in 2021, and you were one of the few artists that was invited to go to the uh, to go to the uh, the Winter Gardens to film that virtual show alongside people like Ali Cook and you know the Who's Who in Magic. There you are. That just shows your standing within the magic community. I don't know why I was invited. I don't know why I was invited. <laughs> I just... I think it was on five minutes, wasn't it? I think it was five minutes. And half, and half of those five minutes was a gag. Let's be honest, it was a gag. Um, it, was, it was an absolute honour to be invited. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed doing it. I don't know what I was doing there, like amongst, you know, the, the royalty of UK magicians that were there. Um, what a great experience it was, though. It was amazing to be involved, like, like it is on this as well. Um, and I guess that's all come from entering that competition at Blackpool, um, I guess which I definitely want to talk about, but we're going to start at the very beginning because a lot of people watch this that are based over in America. Maybe they haven't heard who Graham Shaw is and your story is inspiring. You have done so much. So we're going to, we're going to go through that first of all, and we're going to start at the very beginning. Let me ask you a question, Graham. What is your origin story? How did you get into magic? Is it the typical pull the coin from behind your ear as an uncle, you know, or magic set or something? How did you get into magic? Um, so I was basically used to be a girl um, and, you know, um, I basically I um, pretty much started like most people. I got a Paul Daniels magic kit for Christmas um, when I was about nine, eight or nine years old. Um, and then I started um, doing magic for friends at school and stuff. And obviously friends all loved it. Um, and it just carried on from there, really. Um, I went, I mean, a big inspiration for me was uh, Russ Stevens at Blackpool when I was about, 10 I think it was they used to, we, we used to go to Blackpool every year to go to Treasure Beach and go on the rides and stuff and um, we used to go and see Mystique but Stephen was, was the, the guy so he was like the first live show I ever saw and I was only about 10 or 11 probably at the time this was like in the 90s like late 80s early 90s I would say and we went every year and saw it and um, and I pretty much grew up with Rush Stevens and then saw him on TV and stuff and, and it grew from there and I had a friend at school um, who also did a little bit of magic and we kind of had this weird sort of competitiveness at school, like, or who, who could come up with them, you know, who would, who could learn the best new trick and he would do a trick, then I would do a trick and we'd sort of have a, a magician -y off sort of thing. Um, and, and then it built up from there, as most people do, I sort of get booked out from the library. Do you remember those things? We used to be able to go to them, things called libraries. Oh, remember? yeah, 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 yeah. I remember those back in the day. Yeah, before the internet and before YouTube and they used to get these, things called books that you can open up um, and yeah. read them. And so, yeah, I used to go to the library. The school had a, a library. You used to get books, magic books. I had like two books in. I think they had the Mark Wilson Complete Court and Magic, which was probably one of the first books I got. And then I started going to the library in Prado where I lived and getting higher books out from there. Um, then when I turned 13, I joined the Junior Magic Circle, which was the no part of the Northern Magic Circle, which was run by Cynthia Neptune. Um, it had two two sections, had the Newcastle section and the Bradford section. Obviously, I was in the Newcastle one. Um, it was the same year, actually, that Nicholas Mohammed, I think he's the same age as me, um, he was in the Bradford one. 
and if anybody watching doesn't know, he's well known sort of TV celebrity now, isn't he, Craig? He's, mm -hmm. he's very well known. He was in the Brad Bonners in Newcastle one. A uh, few years there, um, and turned 15, 16. That's when I discovered Magic Box. Magic Box opened in 94, 95. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and I started working at Magic Box part-time, just on a Saturday, um, demonstrating tricks and stuff. Been here ever since. That's what, 25, 26 years ago. Um, and I joined Newcastle Magic Circle when I was 16. Um, what else? Uh, Magic Circle, 16. And then I became president of that. I was the youngest ever person to be elected president when I was 21 or 22, I think it was. And the made as president of the Newcastle Magic Circle. Um, but most of my time, to be honest, I, I, and there were a lot of competitions for which we can talk about uh, at some point. I, I, I love competition. Competitions for me is what makes me um, work towards something and build something up. I need, like, I need to have a goal. Somebody says to me, right, on the 17th of May, you're going to be in this show and you're going to do this, this and this. And I've got something to work towards and I need a goal like that. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I need a goal to work towards. And that's why I end the competition, because it makes it that you've got to put stuff together that's maybe a bit different for other magicians. And just over the years, I've learned how to, how to end that competition and how to get better at winning them, which sounds a strange thing to say. Obviously, you're going to get better at competitions, but there's certain things you need to do in a competition for magicians to win. I'm sure we can discuss that. At some point, but yeah, I definitely want to be discussing that. that. That's, that's pretty much my, my origin story. It's not very particularly exciting, really. Well, um, I've got several questions before uh, we move on about it that, that have come up uh, based yeah. on that. So when did you become a full-time gigging magician? Because obviously the time frame was you left school, you started working in Magic Box. When you were working in Magic Box, were you also doing gigs at that point, or did you start doing gigs earlier on? When 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 did you start actually performing professionally? Um, so I, this is a weird thing, actually. I don't actually consider myself as a full time professional magician, and the reason I don't do that is because although I gig a lot, I have a full time job. Yes, it's at a magic shop, which is quite quite unique to me. But I wouldn't say I'm a full time pro. You know, I don't earn my living just from doing magic performances. I would consider that to be pro. So I would say I'm probably more semi-professional, really. I mean, yeah, at, at the shop, I am doing magic all day. I'm demonstrating and I'm, you know, working on computers and stuff like that and watching videos and editing and doing that. So it, it is magic related, I suppose. Um, but I started really gigging when I was really young, um, doing sort of um, my sister's birthday party. Can't really call that a gig, I suppose. But um, then I started doing my friend's sisters and then their friend's sisters. And this was probably when I was like 13 or 14. I started doing shows for their sister's birthday parties and stuff. And then I would say, probably when I auditioned for the Newcastle Magic Circle when I was 16, um, I don't think I've ever said this in an interview before, but a magician who was really well known in the Northeast, but he's not known amongst magicians, but he's one of the best close-up magicians, in my opinion, in the country is Paul Litton. Um, and not many people have heard of him, especially magicians, uh, but he saw me audition at Newcastle Magic Circle at the time um, and approached us after and said, look, I really, really love your, your performance style. It's really fast. It's really like um, in your face. It's very visual magic. Um, so there was other people at the circle at the time who were great, but they were quite boring and long drawn out stuff. He says, your stuff is really quick, snappy. Um, and I think, you know, I could give you loads of work. They're great. So he started giving me loads of um, uh, corporate stuff, but also regular stuff on Sundays. And there was a few restaurants that obviously when he couldn't do his, his residencies would put me in. And I was pretty much doing all of them. So on a Sunday, I was doing like three residencies for him every week, week in, week out. Um, and when I was about, I think I was seven, I was 18, he started giving us nightclub work, which was amazing. Like amazing. I'm like 18 years old going to nightclubs in Newcastle, showing off for two hours getting free drinks from the bar and then, well, chatting up my luck with that, chatting up some girls and stuff, you know, and um, it was like incredible. And getting paid for it. And, get, and then getting paid for it. And a lot of them were cash in hand at the end. So you'd finish the nightclub at one o'clock in the morning. You'd have, you'd, you've had a few free drinks. Obviously you wouldn't have everything. You'd have a few drinks um, and you'd have a crowd of girls around you and then you get paid cash. It was like the life. This is the life that I want. 
Um, and for me, it's never really been about money initially. It was always about um, performing. Um, and being in the juniors, and probably similar like to you when you started, is everybody was doing stage magic. So stage magic was what I did when I was younger, mainly um, until Paul started giving us, um, you know, this this regular weekend work and stuff. But I used to love doing illusions, and I had a few illusions. And actually, funny enough, you you probably don't know this, but I did actually tour briefly around the UK with an illusion show called Pure Magic, which was like a little mini illusion show. I had it in Guild, and I had a few other bits and pieces. Um, I, went well, I know that you do an illusion act. I know you've got a lot of illusions. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't realise you toured around it, but I mean, you still do the illusion act now, don't you? I mean, uh, you know, I remember a couple of years ago seeing posts on Facebook of you setting up like a big illusion show, something you still do, right? Yeah, I'm massively passionate. I mean, if somebody said to me, what is your, what type of magic do you specialise in? I think I'm kind of a, I'm a jack of all trades. I do, you know, clothes up kids shows, family shows, and stage illusion shows. But the thing I'm most passionate about amongst anything is illusions. And that's probably come from watching Rush Stevens and growing up with the juniors and um, watching David Copperfield, Wayne Dobson. Um, I love illusions, love them. And I've still got a lot of the illusions, which I keep here at Magic Box. Um, and I do them, but very rarely, very rarely. I might do one, maybe two a year, maybe. And to be fair, one of them is usually for South Tyneside for the Family Extravaganza show. Um, which is like a, a show we do at the Custom House, which is a big family audience. And so I've done that for like 16 years in a row. Some years I've done illusions, some years I've done close-up stuff with cameras, other years I've done more of a kids type act. I've done Rocky, I've done everything in that show. So every year I'm trying to find something new. I mean, last year we did a helicopter production uh, for that show with, um, with uh, Danny Hunt and Amethyst. Mm. They helped out with that and that was, that was good. That was good. I don't know how we're going to top that, but I'm massively passionate about illusion shows. Illusion, stage magic is, is my passion, really. Well, I, I've mentioned this on the channel before, but a lot of people that are listening to this that are newer into magic, and we do get a lot of people on this channel that are new into magic, they're probably kind of a bit surprised because these days, when you get into magic, it's not about performing on stage. It's not about getting into illusions. It's about... Uh, close-up magic but when I was younger it was all about doing an illusion show when you got into magic I remember the first thing that I ever wanted to buy was like a chair suspension and I saved up and I got this chair suspension that I kept in the garage I didn't have anywhere to perform it but that's the sort of stuff that was what it was like back then wasn't it back in the day it wasn't it wasn't so much about close-up magic it was more about you know learning to be a stage performer yeah we all let's be honest we all wanted to be David Copperfield didn't we mm -hmm. He was, yeah, he was yeah. like, he, he was the guy at the time. Nobody really did close up back then, I don't think. Um, it kind of was a thing, but I remember watching, um, I don't know, it might have been Masters of Magic or something. And you had like, uh, I don't know, remember, was it Juan Tamarez, I think you had Michael Amar doing stuff like in a close up setting around like a casino table. Was it Masters of Magic or something like that? It was a, a, a t an American show back in the 90s. And that was the only time really you saw close up. You didn't really see it as a, wasn't really a thing that it is now at weddings and corporate events and stuff. I think Faye Presto was the first person to start really kind of popularizing it back in the day, in the UK at any rate. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah. We stand on the shoulders of giants, don't we? So what advice would you give somebody who's wanting to perform on stage? Just somebody who is this jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. Um because, and I've talked about this on the channel before as well, but it's the holy grail for a lot of magicians that start off doing close-up. They want to do a stage show. And I genuinely think that more magicians should be able to do a stage show, especially coming out of COVID. I think mm -hmm. there's going to be more of a demand for performing on a stage distanced away from the audience than yeah. crammed into a venue like Sardines. And I think Definitely. that if people want to continue to perform they are going to have to adapt and they are going to have to go on stage. What advice would you give somebody who wants to be a stage performer but doesn't know where to start? Because it's a world of difference. Yeah, it's, uh, see, I've, I've had this conversation with a few magicians about this. Um, and I think it's easier coming from stage magic to close up than it is going the other way around. Yeah. Because, for instance, I've just took a book in for, I think it's, I can't remember, me or something. I think it's the only one I've got, but I've got two booked in me or something. Um, and it, it's a close-up gig for 30 people, but I know that that is going to be a parlor show. There's 30 people there, right? 
The bonnets of what the lockdown rules are at the time, I don't even know. That, I know that's going to turn into a cabaret show, essentially. But being so sort of coming from stage, and I also think that Cynthia Neptune helped a lot with this. I mean, I used to go to the Junior Magic Circle and other people who, who were a member at the time, I'll tell you this, that we used to, she used to sit in the back of the room and we used to stand at the front and she used to, speak up, speak up, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And that's why I think I've got a really like loud, everybody says, God, you're really loud and like in your face all the time. And it's just come from, from Eden Juniors and Cynthia Neptune telling us to be louder. Um, so advice wise, it's easier if you come from stage to close up, because if you're doing a table, for instance, like in a corporate event and there's 10 people on the table, it's a really loud room. You've got to project yourself to that whole table. So essentially your close up set turns into a mini parlor show. Yeah. You know, um, so you end up doing the stuff up here rather than, than down there, don't you? So you're doing your, your material seems to adapt and change. Um, and I think some close up magicians don't do that. I look with the, the close up magicians at corporate events where it's really loud and they'll entertain them down here and there'll only be like two or three people on the table watching them, the rest are just chatting amongst themselves because they're not like, you know, addressing the whole table, if you like. Um, so I think. That's something, and that's advice, I guess, to go from close up to stage is the first thing to start doing is if you're doing a table, is try and get some material that will work to that whole table. So imagine the worst scenario, it's really loud, it's a corporate event, it's loads of, there's a band on or something, um, which is, you know, and you're trying to do something for that whole table. It needs to be something visual and really project yourself so that everybody can hear without, without shouting, I suppose. And then once you start to get used to doing that sort of thing then you'll find getting up on stage and doing stuff like that is a lot easier but i do think actually um people i think people think closer magicians would find it easier doing stuff on stage than they might first think and i'll speak with some close-up guys and go oh no there's no way i would go up there you know there's no way i would go up there and do something and i think if you find the right material something that you know is going to kill you could go up and just do five minutes yeah. Five minutes, um, if, and if you die, you die. But then do it again and again. Yeah, do something simple. Just do something that you know inside out, um, that you can present to a bigger audience. Invisible deck, for instance, something like that that you can present in whatever way you want to do it. Um, and that, that's the way I would do it personally. Um, but I find it easier for me because I've already done stage stuff, and then close up to the jump back the stage is is fairly easy. It's a bit easier for me, I guess. Yeah. I'd agree with you, a hundred percent. And do you, if there's somebody who's wanting to be a stage illusionist, any advice on that? That's a question I've got an awful lot because there's a world of difference between doing stage magic and going up on stage with your little box and you open up your box and you do your cabaret show mm -hmm. and lugging around illusions. I think there's a lot more work involved in being an illusion act than people realise, and and that's one of my pet hates. You hear so many magicians go. Oh, so easy being an illusionist. You just put a girl in a box and it works itself. You just got to stand there smiling. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Graham? Uh, if you want to be an illusionist, don't do it. No money in it, or very little. I think it's really, I mean, you know, you do illusions. It's very, very hard to make money from illusions. Um, maybe 10 years ago, yeah, you know, but these days, really hard um, to make money. And no one's going to pay or very little, not, not in the Northeast anyway. People just don't want to pay big money for a 45 minute illusion act. They'd much rather just spend money on a band. They get the band for a third of the price, if not a quarter of the price, than mm. what, what we have to charge for an illusion show. It's really difficult to sell it to a client as well. You probably know that I find this anyway. To sell a 45 minute illusion show to a client, all they're seeing is 45 minutes to work and not seeing all the rehearsal stuff that goes on beforehand. Because no, when I do illusion shows, like I say, very rarely, so. I'm not really the best person to talk about this, but when I do an illusion show, no two are ever exactly the same. They always, one wants 20 minutes, somebody will want 15, they'll want 45, they'll want a 10 minute spot. So none of them are ever the same. And because we don't do it often, I've got to spend at least two weeks rehearsing with the girls beforehand. So they don't see all the equipment getting loaded in, they don't see all the work that goes on in the, in the, um, in the, the dance studio, um, all the rehearsals to the music. Uh, getting all the stuff in, getting all it's like it's a two week project. Yeah. People don't, don't understand it, but clients just won't, they just generally don't want to spend the money on that. They just say a 45 minute thing. Um, and I think that's why loads of magicians at the minute have just gone down the route of you know a, a case on stage, packs small, plays big, 
I have no problem with that. Um, I'm just not as passionate about it as I am with illusions. Um, and it's, you know, like you say, people think, oh, it's easy doing illusions, but it's, it's all the staging. And it's so easy to totally destroy an illusion by putting the wrong music to it. You know, you could you could have a great, like an illusion you'd spend 20 grand on, and then you put the wrong music to it, and it just looks terrible. Um, it's just so easy to do that. Um, but I find, I don't know, I find it a bit more creative. Uh, a bit more creative for me doing illusions. I love the fact of you know finding the right music, YouTube and it, Spotify on there, and finding the right stuff. Um, I, I live on there, you know, um, and I'll find I'll find music. I'll be, you know, like the other day I was watching Formula One and a big Formula One fan, and there was a song that they used in the background for the run up, and I was like, oh, that is a great tune, great bit of music. I don't know what I'm going to use it for, so I'm Spotify in it and, and found the music. I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but I've got it in me. My bank of music, which I'll you know use at some point. Um, you go. I don't really get that with close up, you know. But well, musicality is so important, not just for an illusion act, but music can make or break a stage act. It really can. Like mm. I swear, one person, and you've mentioned him before. One person who is brilliant at this is Russ Stevens. Mm. And if yeah. you think about all of the acts that have gone on BGC that he's had a hand in, it's being elevated by the music that's playing in the background. Yeah, yeah. Just, really a back, just a background track. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a huge difference, huge difference. But again, you put the wrong background track on, and it's, you know, and it's terrible. Absolutely. Know. Absolutely, 100%. Well, before we move on, I want to ask you one other question. You said that you're a jack of all trades. We talked about stage, we talked about illusions. You obviously also do kids shows, family shows. You're the current family entertainer of the year. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. There is a perception amongst magicians, especially close-up magicians. They tend to look down on kids entertainers. Um, oh, you're a kids entertainer. Oh, let me just wipe you off the bottom of my foot. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's been the same ever since. Now, obviously, as you know, I do a lot of kids shows, but I also do close-up and cabaret and so on and so forth. Um, I personally think that every single magician should be able to perform for kids. I've been to weddings in the past as a guest and they've hired a magician and there's been kids at the wedding and the magician has actively not performed for the children not, and, and said to the client, no, I don't perform to the children's tables. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wrong. I think that you should be able to perform to some degree to children, even if that's not your end goal. I do think it's a, a skill that you should have and it is a skill. Um, what, what do you think as somebody who is the current family entertainer of the year? Couldn't agree more. I absolutely. I mean, one of my biggest selling points to clients at wedding fairs and stuff is the fact that I entertain the kids as well. It's very rare I go to a wedding where there's no kids at all, even if there's just like two or three. Um, but you'll go to some weddings where they've got a separate table for the kids. And I, that's great for me because I, I can do like a good 20 minutes, half an hour at that table. And that's a massive selling point for me to clients, um, the wedding couples, when, when I say, oh, well, oh, yeah, by the way, I do specialist thing for kids so i'll spend a good 20 minutes with them um they'll get balloon animals or they'll get a magical gift sometimes i'll give them all one of those pop-up one things um or the new thing which we've got in which is great by the way them little animal things the little rubber things we've seen them right they're really awesome. cool yeah so you can do like you take a balloon you push the balloon in your finger you snap in your hand you snap your fingers and it turns into like a mini um balloon animal and they come in like bags of 200 and you give them away at the kids and they're great as well just like little giveaways like that and when you say that to clients oh wow yeah that's great so you're more of an all-round entertainer you do stuff for the kids and for the adults and um, back to what you were saying before about um people looking down on kids magicians yeah 100 percent um i said this in a an article for magic scene actually i think a lot of especially close-up magicians look down on kids entertainers kids entertainers would be better at performing on stage than close-up magicians might be yeah because they're used to performing to you know maybe not on a stage but to a, a bigger group of people whether it be kids whether it be a family you know they're more they're used to how to move on a stage how to walk around um the, the stagecraft tends to be better um and i think people people don't understand it I mean, don't get me wrong there is some kids entertainers out there who miss it. and this is why i think people look down on kids entertainers and there is some out there kids entertainers a lot of kids some kids entertainers don't want to learn any sleight of hand or any skillful type magic so um working on a on a on a standard black pool or working in the shop we get obviously a lot of customers so i see a lot of people 
And we, there's two different types of kids entertainers that I think. The first kids entertainer who just wants magic off the shelf that they can do without thinking about a die box, um, a hippity hop rabbit. Um, and then, you know, and then if you say, oh, we've got this, oh, yeah, but do I not have to sort of palm a coin? Do I not have to learn a sponge bowl routine for that, a retention pass for that? No, nah, I'm not interested in, in that and in learning like sponge balls. I just wanted the stuff that, you know, a box here that does something and then there's a, you know, a rabbit in there or there's a colourful thing of that type. And then you've got the other guys who 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 live for that sort of thing, you know. They'll do Miser's Dream and they'll have the coins palmed and they'll produce the coins and drop them in. And, you know, that's brilliant. Um, so there's the two different types, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's definitely a, a difference there. I do tend to find that the closer magicians that, that do kid stuff tend to entertain families better than a kid, just a kid entertainer. There's nothing else but kids entertainers doing close up. Yeah. They seem to struggle a bit more. So yeah. it, it kind of be, is easier the other way around. So if you're a close up magician, you do stuff for kids. That tends to be, in my opinion, um, they tend to be more family orientated. But imagine like a kid's magician, who just does kid stuff, he just does produces a rabbit, and then that the parents oh, would well, we do some close up stuff and they struggle. Yeah. Um, but they will come to stand and they'll buy some tricks like close up tricks like we'll buy, I don't know, um, burglar bunnies is a great example, which is one of our our, our lines, which is a close up thing for kids. That that's perfect. Um but yeah, and I think that's probably why your close up magicians took look down magician because they assume that the kids magicians don't want to learn any sleight of hand. Yeah. Not I necessarily think... the case. Uh, but you know what? To your point about close-up magic, I think that more close-up magicians right now should be learning kids' magic because it's another avenue to go out and perform as we come out of lockdown and as COVID becomes the thing that we end up living with. There's going to be more opportunities to do kids' shows than there are corporates. I think yeah. corporates are going to take a few years, a couple of years to come back as it was before, but parents are always going to want to have entertainment for their kids. Yeah. They're you know what, Don? As well, you do as well, I love performing for kids. So do I. And we're doing real magic. For, for me, like when I'm doing my family show, a, one of the criteria is the trick has to be able to fool adults as well. So if I'm pulling it, if I'm going to do a kid trick, I want that trick to also fool the adults. Yeah. So it entertains the kids and also fools the adults. But if you do like a beautiful bit of magic, I mean, I still remember seeing Russ Stevens and stuff, and I was speaking to another magician actually very recently, and he says he remembers the first time he saw a live magician, he was like six or seven, and the guy was doing Miser's Dream, and he was producing coins from the from his ear and from his foot and from his thing, and he says, that was such a strong, magical moment. You know, forget about the coloured rabbits and, you know, all of this. There's the coins, producing the coins magically into the bucket. He says, that was, and, you know, bear in mind, we're going to be, we're going to be the first type of magic that pretty much all of those kids in your show are exposed to, you know, it's the first magician they've ever seen. First thing they've ever seen, the first bit of magic they've ever seen. And that is, it's going to stay with them forever for the rest of their lives, you know? I mean, we've got the kids coming here now, which are 15, they remember seeing me for the first time, but they don't, they don't respond like that, actually, that I was crap. Anyway, anyway, for, you can edit this out, wrap it out, can't you? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, it's gone. Yeah, wrap it out. I, yeah, I love performing for kids and family audiences. It's it, it's great, and you know, close to magician should do it more often because you don't you get a much more sense of wonder off a child than you do from an adult, or maybe you don't. Maybe it's not the same, but I don't know. I don't know. There's some, there is something special and magical about child's face when you really do something that they believe is magic. And kids are honest. Like I've seen close-up magicians, and I'm not going to name names. I've seen close-up magicians that are not very good at all, but they've convinced themselves they're decent because adult performances, when you're doing close-up, a lot of the time they'll be polite. They're not going to be rude. They'll go, "Oh, that was very nice," and give the gold yeah. golf clap. You walk in front of a bunch of kids and you you suck. They're going to tell you you suck within seconds. You can't yeah. be bad at performing in front of kids. You've got to have a good act. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the kids also, I think that's maybe maybe that's one of the reasons that close-up magicians don't like performing for kids, because kids always look at the obvious answer. If it's not in this hand, it's obviously in the other hand. Mm. Whereas adults, you know, you can distract an adult, a kid will just go straight for the, the obvious answer. Adults yeah, yeah. don't, you know, you can kind of play it a bit with adults, you know, you can it's direction strong. A kid will look straight at the other hand. And you, you know, and I've seen people get caught out a lot. 
not doing that again. Um, funny enough, here's a funny story for you. Um, and he, he won't mind us telling you this at all, because I think he said this probably before. But when I, I used to do a lot of kids' shows for Newcastle United, and used to book this in every Saturday, and the kids were wild. They were wild. They were like the old end of the scale. So they were like 11, 12 year old. I'm sure you know what that's like as a kid's magician. They're hard entertaining, you know. You can't do the kiddie kiddie stuff. It has to be in between your adult stuff and the kids' stuff. You've got to keep them entertained. Um, I used to do it every week and it was a hockey. And uh, Matthew Dowden, Matthew J. Dowden, good friend of mine, lives in Canada now, very famous actor now, you know, hello, hello. Um, and uh, he, one week I couldn't do it. He said, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. And he'd only just started doing magic at the time. He'd been doing it, I don't know, a few months, maybe a year. And he was mainly doing close up stuff. Um, this was very start of his career when he was just starting out. And he went and did it and he had all these. He was telling us all the ideas and stuff. He was going to do floating table and all this beautiful stuff with music. And he had it all played out in his head. And I was like, it'd be interesting to see how this goes down. And they destroyed him. They destroyed him. He came out of there and he said, literally, he says that word for, I want to burn all my props. I want to burn my props. They destroyed us in that show. He says, I, had, I was trying to do floating table with all this beautiful music. They were running around, they were pulling the cloth, they were doing this. He says, it was a nightmare. He said, it was horrible. It was the worst audience I've ever had. And I said, I don't really fancy doing kids magic anymore. But he, he could have, you know, progressed that. He learned his lesson, as we all do. Um, and he could have done it. Uh, but, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure Matthew will, uh, will be happy for us to tell you that story. Well, if the acting thing doesn't work out, at least he can get back into kids yeah, kid shows. Yeah. Can I just say, by the way, I'm not wearing makeup, but for some reason it looked like I'm wearing makeup. Must be the settings on this computer. So uh, just, I'm anybody just going to have blush on? Uh, I'm not wearing makeup. It does look like I'm not. Honestly, I'm not not wearing makeup. I believe you. I believe you. You're from Newcastle. Real men don't wear makeup. <laughs> anyway, right. Let's move on. I want to ask you one more question before we continue with your career. I don't want to bring you up on that. You said that you started working at Magic Box. Now, I also know that you're a co-owner of Magic Box, but you got a job as a 16-year-old working in Magic Box. How did you end up going from working for the company as a 16-year-old kid yeah. to co-owning it? How did that happen? Just a natural progression, I suppose. I kind of forced myself into Magic Box. I wanted a job. Um, I never got offered a job. I used to go in that often. And it was just a case of I used to keep going in and say to Clive, who's the, the original guy who started Magic Box, and I was just like, you need somebody in here doing magic. And funny enough, Michael Murray was working at the shop at the time. So he had, he'd already started. He started like six months, nearly a year before me, I think, before I started. He was doing Saturdays. And I still remember going in because I was doing stage magic and he didn't really know much about it. I still remember going in and buying a Fantasio appearing candle at the time and asking him to demonstrate it for us. And he didn't have it. He was looking at it this, this way and that way. And yeah, I think, you, I think you, you pull it out like this and then you let it go or something. And and I think something goes in here, and it's very funny. Um, I'd pay I, good I, money to see Michael Murray doing a, uh, doing an appearing candle routine. You too. <laughs> I've got some funny stories about that, which we can talk about, not talk about that now. But, um, yeah, so Michael was already there. I kind of forced myself in. I was like, I need to get a job here. I need to get a job here. And I forced myself in. And I did actually demonstrate a little bit for Marvin's Magic as well when I was younger. So up here in Newcastle, we've got a big, metro, a big um, retail thing called the Metro Centre like a huge retail, you know, uh, thing. Um, and it was a company called The Gadget Shop. It was all around the Northeast. This was, again, back in the 90s. This was probably when I was, just before I started Magicbox, about 15. And I went and then had the Marvin's Magic Range. And I bought a couple of bits, you know, because I didn't know before I knew Magicbox was even there, or before Magicbox opened. And I said to the manager, look, would you like somebody coming in and demonstrating stuff? Um, so I did. So I started demonstrating stuff for them uh, on the counter and obviously selling the Mar Marvin's Magic stuff. Um, and that was one of my first paid gigs, actually. The manager of the gadget shop at the time invited me to go to his house to do close-up magic. Oh, wow. But I was literally, like, 15. So my dad drove us and I took my mate with us because I was, I was really nervous. I took my other, my other mate from school. And we went, and we went into this house. And it was literally, like, a student accommodation thing. And there was, like, 20 people in this house, and I was doing close-up stuff. Um, and that was when I thought, oh, this is great. I love doing, doing, you know, performing and getting paid for it as a bonus. I would have gone and done it for free. Um, <laughs> then Magic Box just been a natural progression, really. I guess um, 
Clive had no choice, really. He's getting old. He needs to give it to somebody. So who's he going to give it to? Uh, the people who've worked there 25 years. Um, that's it, really. It's not, not an exciting story, really. But No, but it's, it's, it's very, very interesting because... Mag- and we'll talk about Magic Box in a bit, but Magic Box has gone from strength to strength to strength. And, you know, it's, it's one of, when you think about the established dealers in the UK, mm. uh, you know, I think there's a list of five, really, when you think about it. And Magic Box is absolutely on that list, 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we started out as, uh, when Ply first started, it was called Magic Box for a reason, because you always wanted to involve magic. But um, it was... M- a lot of magic shops are in a lot of places are with predominantly fancy dress and jokes and novelties and then it was a little little table in the corner a little counter in the corner which had magic in and it was always part of his grand plan was to build up the magic a little bit more because he's right. a local he's not really a magician and um, he had a massive interest in it back in the 90s um, and that's why he took on me and michael so that we would you know build that up and build it up and we did build it up and we build it up and build it up and it becomes so big that it had to have a separate shop was um, back in Percy Street, so I had like the fancy dress on the front, and the, the magic was like down the side street, like a little se- se- separate entrance, secret entrance, people called it. Um, and it built up this thing, and then we built up the internet side of it, which has always been a strong thing for us. We also had a, a video, remember those, the old VHS cassettes? I haven't got any here, but um, we used to send a VHS cassette out, which had demonstrations on of the tricks. Really? really, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's some footage on our website somewhere and on our Facebook page, on the Magic Boots Facebook page, um, of that footage from when me and Michael were like, I don't know, 17, 18. It's on VHS and we're sat in someone's living room with this horrible organ music and we're demonstrating tricks. It was before the internet, you know? And then we'd send the VHS to set out to all the customers. We used to sell it for a fiver, I think. And it was, you know, demonstrations of the stuff. Um, But yeah, that's, that's kind of how Magic Box has progressed over the years, really. That's amazing. And I want to talk more about Magic Box, but I, I, I want to bring up something that you mentioned earlier on, mm-hmm. which is that you love competitions. So mm-hmm. the reason I bring that up is different people have different reasons for competitions. A lot of people enter competitions because they want to advance their career. But you're in a situation where you've got a very secure job that eventually turns into a company that you run. Uh, you've also got, obviously, you've never had a problem getting work as a magician. Uh, you've always been very popular in Newcastle. We talked earlier on off camera. Your SEO is on point. If anybody ever tries to Google magician in Newcastle, you're going to come right up at the very, very top. So you've yeah. never struggled for, even though you consider yourself semi-professional, you never have an issue getting work at all. So why, why did you decide to enter competitions? Why put yourself out there when you don't really need to in order to get work? And mm-hmm. what were your reasons for entering competitions? Um, well, I first started out in competitions when I was in the juniors, in the Northern Magic Circle juniors, and it was really kind of pushed on us, really, originally with, with Cynthia Neptune. Again, she was, like, I can't say enough, praise her enough. She was a, a mentor when I was younger, and she used to, you know, same for all the juniors at the time, but she would push us into the competitions, into the junior competitions and stuff, and that's when I started entering the competitions um, and started doing all right in them. And then when I joined the Newcastle Magic Circle, um, I started entering all their competitions and we went through, <clears throat> funny enough, me and Michael went through a stage where me and Michael would win everything. Um, I'm not saying this big headed, but we went through it where it was literally me versus him. Everybody would come to the competition just to see me face off against Michael. But he would win it one year, I'd win it the other, and then would have, you know, a large banter between them in the shop about who won it. And, you know, if I won it, he would be you know, the next day. It's like when Newcastle plays Sunderland, right? And then, you know, there's two support and you'd get chip you get grief for months and months and months and it's the worst thing when he won a competition because he would go on and on and on and on and on about it man um and that made us that that gave us more enthusiasm to win it next year and beat beat him at that um but so that's one of the reasons but since the nephew pushed me into it michael murray right being just a total i won't swear but a total you know um and then the other reason is really just to advance myself in magic and come up with something new um, and different for magicians that would vote for it. So I kind of got, I think Michael did as well, we kind of figured out how to win magic competitions. And to win magic competitions, you don't necessarily have to do a trick that's going to fool magicians. 
you want to do a trick that magicians would appreciate more, put like little magic bag type things in there, magician lines, um, a trick that would only play for, I mean, you know, as well as I do, there's some tricks that really only play for magicians, or you change a trick so that it'll play, you know, more for magicians that you would never do it for the lay public. I mean, I've got set stuff in the house and stuff here at the shop, which I would never perform for the public, but it's perfect for magicians, and that's perfect for in the competition. And that really is the reason why the competition is just um, trying to think of new stuff and give us as a date to work towards. So if I know the competition is next month, I'm like, I'm really going to get, you know, going to, you know, get on with this and get some stuff and get this down and get this routine together and, and smooth it out. And um, it gives you a date to work work towards, really. And if you win, it's a bonus, but if you don't, you've learned all that new stuff. Right, OK, so... What advice would you give somebody who wants to enter a competition? Obviously, you've mentioned there about um, uh, making sure that it, it, you've got gags in there and you've got tricks that magicians would relate to. Is there anything else that you can suggest? Uh, because it is, again, it's another holy grail for magicians. A lot of magicians want to enter and want to win competitions. You know, you've just won, it, for those people that don't know, and I mentioned it before, uh, Michael won uh, Blackpool 2019, uh, sorry, 2020, the Family Entertainer of the Year, which is a very, very difficult competition to win. It, you, 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 because how they do this, and for the people that are watching in other countries that don't know Blackpool, there's heats, regional heats around the whole of the UK. So even to get into the competition, you've got to win a regional heat against some incredible competition. Then... All of the people that have won those regional heats, which when you think about it, are the best of the best, they come together and they and you, you then have to compete in a very scary environment because you're performing on a massive stage and you're performing in front of a room full of peers because the only people that go and watch the Family Entertainer of the Year competition are family entertainers. You're not going to have a close-up magician go and watch that first thing in the morning so it's normally family entertainers it's your peers and you look out and you see people like john kimmo and you see you know the, the people who are considered great in this industry yeah. and you're looking down and you're looking at them and you're going oh my gosh i've got to do my act on this huge stage in front of all these people there's so many things that you've got to think of with timing and lighting yeah. and and oh my gosh i've got to keep this to time and i i've entered that competition once and you know i mean i didn't win i came second um andy clockwise beat me and fair enough, he was he was so much better. But I mean, you went out there, and you won the whole thing. That's incredible. That's incredible. I don't want anyone to take that away. I want everyone to understand how impressive that feat is. Very few people can say they've won that competition. So if anybody can give advice on how to actually boss a competition, it's you, Graham. God, hey. <laughs> a lot of pressure you just put us under now. It's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> Go um, do do a routine that you do thousands of times that you know inside out, <clears throat> but add a couple of little bits and things in there for magicians. So, for instance, with mine, obviously I did a Rocky Raccoon, you know, act. Um, I, I did the animatronic thing in at the end, but there was a lot of gags and stuff in there which were just for magicians. You know, which were pretty, two seconds. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm just yeah, I'm right in the middle of something at the moment. Yeah, I can do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I'm the winner two two years in a row, yeah. Two years in a row, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, the price has gone up now, it's 60 pounds. Oh, yeah, all right, cheers, bye, bye, bye. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I think I've overused that gag, haven't I? No. Anyway, where was I, yes. Um, yeah, so like in my, I did some, some, <laughs> busy here, so busy. Um, <laughs> Um, what was I saying? Yeah, so the, um, two seconds, I'm going to unplug this phone, right? The bookings are coming in off the roof. Honestly, that would be, you know what, that would be a customer ringing and they'll be like, I've been trying to ring you for half an hour, trying to put <laughs> some flash paper. Uh, yeah, sorry, so um, what was I saying? The competition, yeah. Yeah, in mine I did Rocky Raccoon, but I put like magician bags in there. Um, so, you know, I put the, the Rocky on my head like this and said, um, this is an impression of Pat Fallon, you know, with a ponytail, which obviously you're not going to do that in a normal gig, are you? Because no one knows who Pat Fallon is, do they? Well, he's very famous. Pat, if you're there, love you. Um, and uh, what else? Our hands clock gag. 
that are hands pop gag, um, and a few other sort of kids, um, just general magician gags, miscalling it, um, you know. And, and I think that's what you need to do, just do it regular. One of your routines, you do lots of times. That's a routine I've done, you know, thousand times. More, uh, but just add some stuff into it to make it feel the magicians a little bit more. Um, and also, that, there's a lot of people who end up that competition in particular who go on and do really big stuff. They'll do illusions or loads of stuff. And I think a lot of the people who win it go on and just do, you know, basic stuff, sponge balls. They'll go on with just very little in the pockets and just do something, but just be very entertaining with it. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, that's the main bit of advice for competitions, really, is just do, yeah, do something you've done a lot, but just add a couple of little things in. Like, you don't have to change the whole trick or the whole routine. Add a few bags in, which are just four magicians. And don't be disheartened if you don't win. Get back on the oh, horse. Absolutely not. I didn't enter that competition to win. I entered because I wanted to be on that stage. You know, I've been going to Blackpool since I was 15 or 16. Um, and a lot of those times were with Magic Box when we started dealing. Um, and I've seen everybody on that stage. You know, I've seen some of the greatest magicians and acts in the world on the Opera House stage. That is the place that I always wanted to perform. And it was on my bucket list. I just wanted to perform on that stage. So, yeah, what you were saying before, you have to get through the, the semi-finals. I went to the Glasgow heat, and I didn't, by the way, I didn't get through on the first time. This is the second year that I ended. The first year, I, I didn't get through the heats. I came second in the Glasgow heat, didn't get through. And then I went back the second year and won the heat, and that's when I got onto the, into the final. Um, but the main reason for me was to work that stage. I wanted to perform on that stage. That was the aim. So once I won that competition in Glasgow, I knew that's it. You know, that's it. Doesn't matter if I win. Not bothered. I've achieved my goal of being getting on that stage. And what stage it is, man! You've worked it, haven't you? Yeah, a couple of times. Wow, that is a big ass. It's incredible. It yeah. really One of the other things, you know, when you mentioned before about people watching your act, mm. heard the rumor it was the same year that Lance Burton was on. It was the oh, same boy, year yeah. that Lance Burton was on, and I'd heard that Lance Burton was watching the show. Now, whether he watched the whole show or not, I don't know. He probably got up to my act and thought. I think I'll bail now. I think I'll do, give it a miss once I've started, maybe. But um, um, but I'd heard Lance Burton was in the show at some point. I mean, how cool is that? You know what I mean? You're like performing and Lance Burton's in the audience, you know? It's like... <laughs> That's incredibly nerve-wracking. And were you nervous on a stage like that? Um, A little bit. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. Um, I was a little bit, yeah. Yeah, was 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 breaking it, to be honest. But... um. One of the things with competitions, well, you've got to bring your act right down. I mean, that act normally in my family show is about 15 minutes. Um, and I had to bring it down to 12 minutes for the heat. For the heat, I'd be 12 minutes, which I thought, right, okay, we'll get down to 12 minutes. And then I found out that actually for the competition in that pool, you had to do it to 10 minutes. So I thought I'd got Zach down to 12, fine. Then I had to find, get rid of two more minutes out of it um, for the competition in that pool. And that was hard. Like getting rid of two another two minutes that was difficult but you know we got got there I guess eventually um but that that's probably the hardest bit is getting your rack down at the right time hard bit yeah because yeah. you're going to lose points you're going to end up being penalised if it yeah. goes over and it's mm -hmm. you know it may, it means it has to be really tightly scripted and you can't yeah. live too much yeah, yeah. as you as you know doing a kids routine or a family routine but in ten minutes is hard yeah, it is. It is, it, it is hard doing the 10 minute routine you know, getting, really getting the kids and that on side and getting the adults on side in 10 minutes can be quite difficult but you know there we go absolutely now let's swing back round to magic box and the reason is uh obviously you stock a lot of products uh you stock an awful lot of products here's a question for you i have talked on this channel over and over again of so many bad tricks that come out you know you see them all the time i review a lot of them there's a lot of terrible tricks that get released these days but there's probably a lot of people that are watching this interview that aspire to create their own product they want to create their own product they want to release it they want to produce it as a dealer i'm sure you've seen tricks come in from murphy's or whatever that have been incredibly good and i'm sure you've seen tricks that have come in that you just think no one's going to buy this I feel like putting it in the bin. Any advice for people who want to release a product from a dealer's point of view? How can they ensure that that product is going to be well received by the community and 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 successful? 
Wow. Um, the first thing is make sure it's yours. Um, it's that much stuff that I see that isn't like, you know, I'm like, that's, I'm, I, and I have to wrap your brains. I'm thinking, like, somebody will send something and say, oh, what do you think of this? I'm like, I'm sure I've seen that somewhere before. And then I have to go and do some research. And then I find out it's, it, it's been on somebody else's DVD or in someone's book or it's part of another trick. I mean, and that only took me half a day to do that research. And you're thinking, well, surely you could have done that research, really, to find out if it's if it's original or not. Um, um, so, I mean, that's the first thing is make sure it's, you know, it's yours. You know, contact as many people as you can. Contact dealers and say, look, well, what do you think of this? And most dealers will come back and say, oh, yeah, we think it's good. But I think such and such has got that in his whatever or that was released on this or that or, or something. That's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, I don't know, um, there's different ways of releasing products. Some people want to produce the product themselves um, and then wholesale it to dealers, which is fine. Some people, you know, if it's something that has to be um, produced and you're going to have to buy a thousand of them to make it worth your while, then it's worth going to a dealer to do that and getting the dealer to, to make that item. Um, just trying to think of a good but example. You produce tricks. You know, there's the, the Magic Box has got a... Yeah big range of products that you've produced in-house how would somebody get on the magic box radar how would somebody they've got this trick they think that it's good they've worked it in the real world they've done their crediting they've checked with people they think as far as they're aware it's original how are they going to get on your radar to get you to produce it just let me get in touch send us an email i mean one of the things that we we always like to be upfront about and we're trying to be really fair about it. if somebody comes to us with a trick um, would but I think a lot of people are worried that you might rip it off as well. Like if they show you the trick and show you the method, and then you don't move forward with that person, then all right, we'll rip it off. You know, that definitely would never be the case with Magic Box. You come to a show that shows the idea, shows the trick, we might say, yeah, we'll love that. Um, you know, and make an offer, or um, or we might arrange to move forward, or you know, they might decide that it's not something that they want to release with us. That's absolutely fine. We wouldn't, you know, have an you know, they might decide to go elsewhere, um, which is not a problem at all. But I think that's one of the problems. People are frightened that, you know, someone's going to rip them off, you know, that, it'll, that somebody else will produce it. Never, ever happened at Magic Box, ever. You'll find nobody would ever, ever say, say different, I don't think. Um, so don't be frightened just to get in touch. Even if you think, like, that's a silly idea, you know, just shoot us an email, get in touch, give us a ring, uh, even come into the shop and, you know, We'll chat about it, but don't be frightened to do it. Might not be something that might work out between us, but you know, it might be just something really good. And then we can even help you develop it. You know, um, if it's something we could help you, we also have magicians who will rely on who then will send the stuff out to and they come up with different variations. Uh, as you know, we're very, we're still very close with Michael Murray. Michael's produced, you know, a few tricks through Magic Box in the past. Um, he's a very, very clever guy, very inventive, um, and he can put his spin on stuff. Um, I mean, Magic Box isn't a massively known company for producing our own stuff. We do have our own lines, you know, a fair few, but we're not like a known company for that's all we do, you know. We 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 try to we, we want to try and improve that, I guess, and you know, produce more of our own stuff as everybody does. Um, so yeah, just get in touch, send us an email. Yeah, because I mean, I, I'm thinking, does you guys have always got something you've always got something very very clever at blackpool i'm always the first your stand is one of the first stands that i go to when i go to a blackpool magic convention because i know that you're going to have something that's incredibly clever that's well thought out that just is designed to work you don't release pipe dreams you know the the, the tricks that you produce are great i mean my go-to routine and i know i'm going to be doing a review show special on some of your items that are maybe slightly less well known uh, and one of my tricks that i'm hoping to actually look at in that review show that i did for years and years and years is the money spinner i mean that's an example of a magic box trick that is absolutely brilliant as somebody who's a coin worker it's one of the best coin tricks that you'll ever do it's amazing mm -hmm. yeah there is yeah i mean there, there is some people who have come to us in the past with an idea and we didn't really think it was good enough to release or maybe it's not worth a trick. It might be more, be you know, more beneficial for them as a download um, or an ebook, or or maybe a book or a DVD. Well, DVD not, not anymore. But um, and sometimes we, we don't release everything that comes our way. You know, there is some stuff that we just don't think is is is, is good enough to release. You know. 
Yeah. Um, simple as that. Um, but yeah, there's been some good ones over the years. Been some good ones. Has been definitely. So let me ask you uh, one more question. The question I want to ask you is: Can we talk about the convention? Because the the convention that you got Magic Box sponsors the is it the South Shields convention? Is that yeah? yeah. So yeah. the which I've been to two or three times and I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite conventions and a lot of magicians aren't aware of it, maybe because it's in Newcastle and it's like really far away from pretty much everybody. Yeah. But it's such an incredible convention that magic box sponsor every single year. And the lineup that you get every year is incredible. And I want more people that are watching this to come to that convention because it's brilliant. Can you tell me a little bit about how it all got started? Because also how it got started is very different to a normal magic convention. And for anybody watching this, normally how a magic convention starts is you'll have a group of people or a magic club that goes, hey, let's do a magic convention. And then they put the convention on and it's done in a very similar way. But this was organized by the council back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah, it still is. Oh, it still is. Still is. That's yeah. very weird, isn't it? I mean, I've never seen another count, uh, you know, I, where I live, I can't imagine South Staffordshire Council going, right, okay, we're going to have a magic convention. Like, how did that all come about? Yeah, I think, to be honest, the council had money to spend back in the day. I mean, this is going back 16 or 17 years when the council actually had money. Um, to spend and the reason that it had to be the time it was if you kind of think about it logically when I'm saying this that they had money to spend um, it was at the end of March just before April the 5th just before the end of the financial year mm. um, so they had money to basically that they needed to get rid of and they had, to, they had a budget so I'm led to believe that they had to pile into tourism um, so they, they had X amount of money left they had to spend um, on tourism bringing people into the area um, and that's how it got involved with magic is anyone's guess, really. I think it was down to Martin Duffy, actually, now, now I think about it. Um, somebody must have saw Martin somewhere and got in chat, and what would about if we had a magic comment? What, 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 how would that work? And then it ended up being, you know, I think 150 people the first year. The names were fantastic. The first year we had it, it was like Anacek, Greg Wilson, Luke Jamey, um, um, or it's wild. I mean, this is going back 16 or 17 years now. The lineup, oh, Sylvester the Jester, uh, the very first, that was the first time he'd ever been in the UK, first time Banachek ever been in the UK. Um, it was a fantastic lineup. It was like unreal. Um, and yeah, they just they, they had money, they had friends. The council organized the whole thing. Uh, I think Martin was slightly involved first year, but just broke in the act, like saying, well, let's get this, let's do this. But as a dealer, had the dealers there, right? And literally down a corridor in the hotel, every dealer had their own room. So you go down the corridor and to the right was Magic Box and next door was Practical Magic. Uh, Derry was there at the time. And as you went down the corridor, everyone had their own room with all the magic in the room. Um, but the best thing is the dealers got paid to be there. What? The dealers were paid to be there. So every dealer that was there, I think it was about 500 pounds. So we got paid because the council didn't know how to run a convention at the time. They thought, oh yeah, we'll have to pay. So we all got paid 500 pounds to turn up the cell with one stuff. What, what, what convention does that happen at? None, none. Um, once they cottoned on, mind about other conventions, it didn't happen the next year. But um, they all got paid to, to, to turn up and sell with stuff, you know. Um, but the council still organise it now. We're just gone like this, as you can quite imagine. Um, but the council are still heavily involved, still organising, and I don't think there's any other convention in the UK um, that's organised by a council. No, as far as I'm aware, I don't think it is. But what its strength is, is it's only limited numbers. So generally, there's 100, I think it's limited to 200 people, so it's quite a small, intimate convention. If anyone's been to, like, um, Tricks and the Sticks, for instance, it's that sort of atmosphere. Everybody, everybody is talking to everybody. Everybody in the bar is talking to them. And if, if I want to check there, Sylvester Gesta, you guaranteed you will be in the bar with him, or you might be having a meal with him. It's just, it's so intimate. Uh, um, you know, they don't go off and find that doing their own thing, they're all in the same place. Whereas if you go in the Ruskin, it's full of like three, four hundred people, you don't really see anybody. Whereas this, you know, it's very limited in, in this little, everything happens in the same hotel as well. So the lectures and everything were all in the same place, so everyone's rammed together. Um, so, you know, you'd be drinking with Sylvester Jester, Banachek, Greg Wilson. That's the beauty wow. of that convention. It's so intimate, you know. That's um, incredible. And is it obviously it didn't run in 2020? 
Yeah. Is it running in 2020? As far as I'm aware, um, they are booking the acts and stuff now. Um, Steve Gore has a, a hand in that now. Steve, he took over from John Archer, who took over from uh, Martin Duffy. And uh, so Steve's got go books all the acts and stuff now. And I know there is a few acts booked. I can't say who they are at this point in time until they officially release it. But yeah, they've got a few things. So as far as we're aware, it is going ahead. It's moved to October now, um, rather than than March. Um, so hopefully that'll happen later this year and be good. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. And everywhere is there a website, by the way, for that that I can put? Down? Yeah, I think it's South Hindside Magic Festival or something off the top of my head. But I'll, if you just I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I'll put if you it. Google like South Hindside Magic Convention or Festival, it'll bring it up. That no okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, before we wrap all this up, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you one more question, which is, what's next for you, Graham? Because, and, and I'm going to reiterate what I said at the beginning, you have had an incredible career. You know, you, you, you co-run one of the most successful magic dealers in the UK. You've had a, a career where you've won competitions, you've performed at big events. Like I say, you've never at any point uh, been short of work. Uh, you've, you've had the sort of career that most magicians would dream of if you could go back in time and say to 16 year old Graham, who was begging for a job in, in, in Magic Box, well, you know, fast forward X amount of years, you're going to be owning Magic Box. Oh, and you're going to also have done this, this, this. Oh, and you know that stage that you've been looking at that you, when you go to the Blackpool convention that you've been looking at since the age of 10. Yeah, you're going to be on that stage entering a competition and you're going to win the whole thing. I think 10 year old Graham would go, wow, I'll take that. So you've had a great career, right? But yeah. Well, yeah, I guess. Well, you have, you have, you absolutely have. When you put it like that, it sounds better than I thought it sounded. So it's true, and I want people to know just how much you've just how much you've accomplished. Because a lot of the people that watch this, because I see the analytics to this channel, they're from abroad, they're from America or Canada or somewhere, and they might not know who you are. And I know that you're you're uh, you know I I know that you're a very humble guy, but I want everybody to know just what you've accomplished. You have done so much. Um, you really have. Is there anything left on your bucket list that you haven't done, your magical bucket list? Are there any aspirations of things that you want to do in the future, um, uh, both personally and also uh, with Magic Box? Is there anything that you want to kind of do in the future? Um, yeah, personally, I would like to do the Magic Castle. Um, that's always been on my bucket list. I've always wanted to do the Magic Castle. Um, um, it might happen in the near future, hopefully. Um, I spoke to Greg Wilson about it years ago, and it's something I've always wanted to do. Um, and I think English people go down well there, regardless of how good or bad we are. So I think I'll be all right. <laughs> so if they can understand us, they might have to put subtitles maybe along the bottom with the accent. But yeah, uh, yeah so um, Magic Castle is probably a magical thing for me. It's, it's something I'd really want to do. Um, and with Magic Box, really just yes, release more. Uh, more magic box products, I suppose, um, and have more people come to us and say, oh, we've got this great idea, what do you think of this? Um, that's probably the main thing for magic box. Um, and just touched on something you said before, um, and this will probably sound controversial to a lot of people, but um, one of the things I would say to anybody young who wants to do magic professionally, is going to do it professionally, in my opinion. I'm really lucky because I, I work at the shop, but I think you need that, especially at, with the whole corona thing and covid like you need to have um another job in my opinion mm -hmm. um i've got a lot of people come to say oh, how can i become a professional magician i mean my advice always is don't do your gigs do do your shows but keep a job keep a job i mean try and find a job that obviously you're going to like as well but um you know just for that security and there's a few reasons for that like a lot of people think um magicians uh make a fortune Right, the, the, a lot of people think, "Oh, you're a magician. You, you must be worth a fortune." And also, people think because you run a magic shop, you're worth, you're a millionaire. Um, you, you know, you've been, you know, magic shops. That what the markup is and tricks is terrible. Um, it is. Li literally, and if anybody you know, thinks differently, I don't know if you ever saw the interview I did with Dave Bonsall. No. 
not yet. No, I'm going to go and watch it. I'm going to go and watch it. Prop Dog. It was the most honest interview ever. He talked <laughs> about how he actually broke down how much he makes when he brings something in from Murphy's and when he sells this. And he said, when you take into consideration the cost of running the place and the lights yeah. and, and, and the staff, you know, you go and buy. And then he talked about how, you know, somebody will come into the shop and spend five hours looking around and then buy an invisible deck. And I've had to pay a member of staff five hours to demonstrate tricks. And that person's come in and bought an invisible deck. I'm massively at loss. Like he was completely honest about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like people think because you run a magic shop, you must be a millionaire, but couldn't be further from the truth. It's very, very hard. And this is what I say to a lot of the young kids who come in the shop is it's really, really difficult to make good Make a lot of money from performing magic. That's the first thing. It's very, very difficult to become famous from doing magic, right? It doesn't matter how good a magician you might be, getting to that next stage of being famous, very, very difficult. And only few of us get there, right? We know that. Um, but making money from magic, yes, you can make a good living. Like when I was like going back from before when I was 16, 17, yeah, I was making a fortune at the time for a 16, 17 year old. And I had friends who were studying law and doing this and they were just going to university and stuff and they were on the bones of their arts really and I was making a fortune but they are now running their own multinational companies now do you know what I mean and I'm still performing magic on nearly the same sort of wage as I was when I was 18 19 yeah the, yeah the money's gone up obviously but not to the extent where they're running like a multinational company um and the, the, the reason I, I say to to have another job as well as magic is because you'll keep your passion longer for magic, in my opinion. If you turn your magic into a full-time job, your passion, as much as you want it to be, as much as, as passionate as, it, as you are about magic, you will lose the passion a little bit if you're doing three weddings in a day and you're doing the same stuff at every table over and over. You you will lose the passion a little bit. It's just it's a natural thing. Because um, you you're doing it now. And you have to have to do those jobs to put to food on the table. You know what I mean? You can't just go, oh, you know, I'm, maybe I'll not do two this weekend. I'll just take that one on. You're now thinking, I need to take like four jobs this week, really, to pay the mortgage. Yeah. Um, you need that security. And then because you've got the security of another job, you'll enjoy the magic when you do it because you're not doing it A, as often. Uh, and B, you, you know, you're passionate because you're not, you, you, you don't have the pressure of the money thing. Um, so you'll enjoy it more. Yeah. And, advice really for that it's true i've seen magicians i've actually seen them at gigs and you can just tell that they've lost the passion they no longer love magic they've got nothing else to do and they're just going through the motions and mm. they're saying the same thing they're saying the same stock lines there's no real interaction they're just going through the motions and there's nothing more sad to see that really and you yeah. are right when you become a professional magician you have to sacrifice artistic integrity for money you know why you see every professional magician in the uk doing the omni deck and doing the ambitious card i bet you half of them don't want to do it but they do it because it works and it's why so many of the best magicians that you'll ever meet are the people like the john bannons and the john gustaferos and the joe reinfleeches and people like that that are basically to have their own job they're amateurs but they get to create all this amazing magic and i, I totally get where you're coming from yeah, I just, yeah, for me, I don't really want the pressure of having to make money from magic. I mean, I do. I'm, I keep saying that. I'm, in a uni I'm very lucky, really. I'm in a unique position because I'm at Magic Box through the day and then, you know, doing shows on a night time and a weekend when you come back. Um, but I don't have to necessarily rely, and I think I've learned a lot more through COVID, I don't have to rely on performing um, to pay the bills so that I'm a bit more passionate about it, I suppose. When I was younger as well, I used to do loads of kid shows. I used to do like three or four a day, um, but I was literally on autopilot. I knew I was, and I would come home at night time and just, like, I couldn't even remember what shows I'd done, you know? Whereas now if I do one on a Saturday, I really, really enjoy it, really enjoy it. Um, same with the wedding, you know, if I'm, um, but hopefully, you know, we'll get a lot more weddings later this year, but um, have another job, have another job. If you can. That's great advice. That really is. And you are right. It is controversial because a lot of people disagree. And and just to add to that, there are people that are doing really well as professional magicians. Oh, yeah. It can be done. It can be done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you are right. And you do need an exit. You do need an exit strategy. If you become a full-time professional magician, 
you need an exit strategy because there's nothing sadder than seeing a 65 year old guy trying to do the act that he did when he was 25 unable to do it anymore yeah yeah you've hit the nail on the head there that's pretty much what kind of what i was trying to get out in the in, in what i was saying you'll you, you hit you hit a ceiling don't you you hit a ceiling where you can't physically do any more shows in, in this in that week you can't really do any more that's the most money you're ever going to make right it's never going to get any more than that you know you, you to progress the next thing from that really is doing what tv work or maybe um i don't know doing work abroad and that's easier said than done um you, you're gonna you're gonna peak your career is gonna peak and then from there you know you're gonna and we ain't got you know you've got pensions and stuff like that maybe you need investment and in various different things which a lot of us have but um mad it's hard it's hard to make good good money for magic you can make a good living don't get me wrong but you know you want to you know you've got you've got friends driving ferraris and lamborghinis and stuff and you know they've got huge massive detached houses and stuff get to that level from performing magic is really hard it is. really hard it's why i set up a company it's why i set up two companies that supply entertainment outside of just being a performer because you're right if you're just going out and doing gigs for yourself and that's it you have a certain ceiling that you can hit and you can never go past that ceiling. 100% totally agree with you. Yeah. Agree with you. Well, it's a bit of a uh, sad end to an interview, this, isn't it, actually? It is. It is, it is in a way, but this <laughs> interview has been incredible. It's really interesting to see your, your take on things from a dealer's point of view. It's also very interesting to just hear about your career and I, 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 some of the stuff you were saying, I didn't know. I didn't know that Magic Box was owned by somebody else before you. There's a lot of stuff that I wasn't aware of. Um, it's been amazing. It really has. And anybody who's watching this, down below at the bottom of the screen and in the description to this video, there's going to be a link to Magic Box. They ship worldwide. You ship worldwide? Um, yeah. You ship worldwide. Please support them because they are one of the good guys in Magic. You really are. I, I, you know, I've, I've known you guys for years. You've always got the time for everybody. You're always happy to help. Um, I remember Blackpool the 2020, I was desperately in search of a pack of cards, if you remember. I don't know if you remember this. This is the sort of people that, that Magic Box are. So I was performing in the bear pit at Blackpool 2020, and it was in the morning, and I, I was meant to start, and typical disorganized me, I forgot my pack of cards. Like I was going to do a card routine, and I forgot my deck of cards. And, and I was like, you were right by the entrance to the, the dealer hall. And I was there stressing. And you probably don't remember this, but you were like, what's the matter? I'm like meant to be doing thingy in 15 minutes. I've, I've not got my pack of cards. I've not got my wallet. I've not got any money on me. And you just went and grabbed a whole, you, you grabbed me like five or six different colored decks of cards and all this stuff. You said, here you go, off you go. Uh, just come back later on and sort it with me. And that's the sort of people that we're dealing with here at Newcastle. Uh, at Newcastle, obviously, at Magic Box, you guys other good guys and you're uh, I, I need everyone to know that because i want them to support you i want them to go check out your website order from you because dealers you are right you know people think that you're millionaires you're not and brick and mortar magic shops like yourself they need our support and i would like everybody watching this to go and support you Greg. i appreciate it really appreciate that really appreciate that and um Thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure to be on, I can't, can't believe I'm saying, I'm on Craig Petty's YouTube channel. I can't what? believe I've got you on my channel. How did that happen? You know what? I've been wanting you from step one, but I wanted to get the Spellmans and the John Archers and the Greg Wilsons on because I wanted you to see that it was at a certain level before I had the guts to ask you. No, you wanted the good people on and then, you know, you are scraping the barrel with me, let's be honest. Oh, scraping no. The no, 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 the no, 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 no. You'll know when I'm scraping the barrel. You'll know. There's a, you'll, you'll, you'll really, there's, a, there's a long way to go before I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel. You are, you are on my bucket list from step one. I love speaking to people that are out there doing it. And, uh, you know, I especially love speaking to dealers. You know, I've, I've interviewed Harry Nardi. I've interviewed uh, Dee Christopher. I've interviewed uh, yourself. I've interviewed a lot of dealers. Mark Mason. Um, the list goes on and on because I, I, I like to see, I like people to see things from, from a dealer perspective as well. So love Mark. Mark is like a, a dealer. He's like an animal. He is a machine when it black will. Like he sells, he sells me stuff that I've already got for, on the stand, man. I went, I can't remember it was two years ago. He was demoing something on the stand. I was like, I'll buy that. And I walked away. I'm thinking, we've got this. We've got, I've, 
Mark, I've got this. I've got, I've got this on the stand. <laughs> and I'm like, how have you managed to get us to buy this? Anyway, so no, that's the other thing. That's the other thing that we haven't even discussed. But I don't know how people like you and Mark Mason can still keep a smile on your face after day three. You know, I used to do a lot of. Uh, I used to be on the stand for David Penn at World Magic Shop an awful lot. Yeah. By the end, of, by halfway through the third and final day, I was ready to headbutt anyone who just looked at me the wrong way, <laughs> especially somebody who's asked to see the same trick for the 14th time and has walked away 13 times saying, I'll come back and they want to see the same thing again. Mm. I was ready to literally throw them off the balcony. I really was. And yet you are always there with a smile on your face three days in. It's, I don't know how you do it because, oh my God, it drove me up. The I can board. tell you how I do it, it's alcohol. <laughs> Alexander Paul. Um, we're getting older now though, aren't we? We have to put young people on the stand these days. Like you'll notice I'm on the stand, but I'm not on the stand as much as I used to be. We have to have younger kids. It's hard work, man. Those three days on your feet constantly demon is hard, like really hard, as you know. You know, but um yeah, it's good. And yeah, um then you look at Mark Mason, he's not getting any younger and he's just he's there. Not, and he's still doing it, he's still doing it, he's still going strong, um, still going really strong. Um, that's just one of the things we want to be known at at Magic Box is to be friendly and, you know, um, help anybody that we can and be honest as we can as well. Um, you know, help anybody when they need it and give them, the, you know, honest advice. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you do that in spades. So, guys, make sure you support Magic Box. The link's at the bottom. I'm also going to put a link right there as well for the convention. It's an amazing convention. As far as we're aware... COVID permitting, it's running in October. I think I'm going to be coming along because Ryland was meant to see his first magic convention this year. He was meant to go to Blackpool for the first time. He was gutted that he missed. So if it is going ahead, I'm going to bring Ryland up and, and we'll spend awesome. a couple of days up there. So That'd be good. I think he'd have a blast. So I'm definitely going to be there. Uh, check out the link at the bottom. They are booking the act. So hopefully it's going to go ahead. And one more time, Graham, thank you so much for coming on the channel. You are amazing. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It was good. You the man. Now, guys, do me a favour. Leave a comment down below. I'm sure Graham will uh, see them. So leave a comment down below. No, you might not see them. Maybe, maybe not. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think of the interview. Also, do me a favour. If you've shopped at Magic Box before, are they as friendly as he says? Let me know in the description down below in the, uh, the comments. And don't forget, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and like the video. I'm going to be back again tomorrow with three videos, one at two, one at six, and one at nine. So I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks very much for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV.